There was a time only a very few years ago when cerebral vascular disease posed a lesser diagnostic problem to the physician. Without methods of treatment, he had no impelling reason to decide whether his patient was a victim of cerebral thrombosis, embolus, hemorrhage, or one of the rarer diseases. Sufficient to know that it was not some disorder for which the patient could be helped. He wrote CVA and considered that he had made an adequate diagnosis. Today, a physician making only that notation might be thought lax. With the advent of methods of treatment, the patient has a right to a differential diagnosis. Antihypertensive drugs, new methods in vascular surgery, and anticoagulants are available at this time. These offer health to many patients, but the offer is contingent on accurate diagnosis. I just, I just got a swollen face, so I went home by myself. I went to my house, and what I did, I, I watched the television that night at 11 o'clock, fixed some soup, and went, lied down, went to bed at 11 o'clock. In the morning, about 7 o'clock, I woke up, I went to go to the toilet, I found myself paralyzed on the right side, I couldn't move out of the bed. It was really bad, though. I couldn't move. I couldn't do nothing. You were home alone when you woke up in the morning? Yeah, I was all alone. I was laid in bed from 8 o'clock to about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. How did you get help? Help. I didn't get any help. I, li I lived by myself. I, I, I called, fell down on the floor on the right side. Now I went and got the phone and then dialed with one hand. And I called him up and then he, he told me where to come. I couldn't talk very good, so I went home, 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 like that. The time of onset, whether during waking or sleeping, and the speed with which symptoms develop are both useful items of information. Thrombosis is more apt to occur while the patient is asleep or just after rising when the blood flow and pressure are reduced. Hemorrhage is more likely to occur during waking hours when the patient is active. An embolus, on the other hand, may break loose at any time. Information on possible premonitory signs also can be very significant. How did your trouble begin? Well, it began one morning. I got up in the morning with a swollen face. I went to work, and I worked that day. I worked, put my eight hours, and then went back home again. I woke up the next morning, and my face was swollen, but it was a little worse. And so I went to work, and. And I went to work, my boy come over and come over by 11 o'clock to work. He says, what's the matter? Dad, you, you look, we sick. I told him, I just bit my tongue, I don't know. He said, no, you got to see a doctor. Come on home. What did, he, what did he see that bothered him? Well, he saw my face was swollen on the right side, of my, and I couldn't talk very good, see? And so he said, you got to see a doctor. And he come over with me and to go to my doctor. And he took me to his doctor. The doctor examined me. And then when he examined me, he found my heart body pressure was 210. He told me that I had a side stroke. One of the frequent features in the onset of thrombosis is a stepwise development, as in this case, particularly if the occlusion is in the internal carotid artery. Thrombosis may begin with a relatively small neurological deficit, perhaps followed by some remission. Hours or even days later, another episode may leave the patient with further involvement. The full-blown hemiplegia may only result later. In another patient, transient focal ischemic attacks may occur over an extended period before the major episode. There is growing evidence that the great majority of thrombotic attacks 
are preceded by these warnings or come in a stepwise fashion. Early recognition of these signs is at present our greatest opportunity for acting to prevent a catastrophic attack. On the other hand, an embolus by its very nature causes a sudden onset. A series of emboli may occur, but as they will almost development of collateral circulation, the clinical picture develops within a few seconds or minutes. Symptoms of intracerebral hemorrhage usually progress over minutes or hours, depending on the rate of bleeding. Just leave your head loose. That's it. Good. Does that hurt? No. Oh. Fine. Would you close your eyes? The absence of nuchal rigidity in this case uh, is a strong indication okay. against hemorrhage. Show me your teeth. Show me your teeth. Grin hard. That's it. Good. The problems of trying to determine the site of the damage and the vessel involved are no longer academic ones. We will not show the complete neurological examination, but rather the positive signs shown by this patient. Good. That's fine. You raise this arm. Good. Give me your fist. Squeeze my fingers as hard as you can. Good. That's fine. Can you raise this arm? The motor deficit is obvious. Squeeze my fingers just as hard as you can. Squeeze them hard. Uh, okay, that's fine. Lift this leg up straight, would you? The patient Good. has already that's regained fine. considerable now function in his right straight. leg. Good, that's fine. Just relax. Good, just relax. The right plantar reflex is extensor. Just leave your arm loose. Reflexes on the affected side are hyperactive, particularly in the arm. But it usually results in ischemia of the same region of the brain. Symptoms frequently vary, however, because of collateral circulation which may be provided from the unaffected internal carotid or the basilar artery via the circle of Willis. A clue to occlusion of the internal carotid is provided by the eye on the affected side. Decreased blood flow in the ophthalmic artery often results in transient ipsilateral blindness. This may be prevented in some patients by the collateral circulation through the circle of Willis. Or collateral circulation may come from branches of the external carotid on the affected side. But even in such cases, it is logical to assume that the blood pressure on the affected side will be lower. A reduced retinal artery pressure measured by an ophthalmodynamometer is a useful indicator. When blood flow is occluded, a reading is taken. A possible difference in blood pressure between the two eyes can be measured in this way. Examining the circulation in the retinal vessels is helpful in assessing the general condition of the vascular system. But we cannot assume a direct correlation with the condition of the cerebral vessels. There are small vessel changes here compatible with arteriosclerosis. Observing the circulation in the lower extremities is also helpful. Though we can perhaps assume a certain amount of atherosclerosis in older patients, we have no reliable way of estimating the involvement of the cerebral vessels. Lesser pulsation on the affected side may be revealed by palpation of the carotids, taking great care not to compress them. Carotid stenosis is also suggested by a loud systolic bruit if present over either common carotid bifurcation. 
However, negative findings, as in this patient, do not exclude the possibility of occlusion in the internal carotids. Blood pressure is now 190 over 110. But since hypertension is frequently associated with hemorrhage as well as thrombosis, the patient's hypertension does not help in differential diagnosis. The patient's cardiac history helps in estimating the possibility of embolism, which is much more frequent than was formerly supposed. Most often, it is a complication of rheumatic or atherosclerotic heart disease. During atrial fibrillation, for instance, a mural thrombus may form in the left atrial appendage and give rise to an embolus. Emboli may also be produced following myocardial infarction, bacterial endocarditis, cardiac surgery, or other less frequent disorders. An electrocardiogram should be taken to rule out a possible unsuspected myocardial infarct. Then, too, an embolus may arise in one of the carotid arteries. If there is no evidence of disease of the heart itself, as is true in this case, it is less likely that the attack can be the result of an embolus. In a further effort to find out whether the occlusion is it and carotid sinus, the internal carotid is completely occluded. Such a case might well be a candidate for vascular surgery. Another indication for angiography is when a diagnosis of vascular disease is uncertain. An unsuspected brain tumor was revealed in this case, the kind of lesion which might well mimic vascular disease. A lumbar puncture is usually considered routine and without risk if performed properly. It can change what has been considered an obvious diagnosis and also is important if anticoagulant therapy is being considered. The fluid is clear in this case. The cerebrospinal fluid pressure is normal. Both findings are compatible with thrombosis. Or does not absolutely rule out the possibility of hemorrhage. In our case, however, the great preponderance of evidence indicates otherwise. These cumulative items of evidence make a diagnosis of thrombosis reasonably certain. Unfortunately, signs and symptoms do not always fall neatly into obvious categories. Before making a decision, a physician will sometimes need to do repeated neurological examinations and observe the patient over a period of time. Not infrequently, too, there are puzzling cases that will suggest consultation with a neurologist or consultation regarding possible vascular surgery. Parenthetically, comparative frequency is difficult to determine and estimates vary in different studies. Thrombosis, of course, is most frequent, estimates ranging from 50 to 80 percent. Estimates of embolism range from 5 to 25 percent. Hemorrhage, 8 to 25 percent. Sometimes the physician has the opportunity of seeing a patient before a major thrombotic attack occurs. This is Leslie Cayburn, a 59-year-old physicist 
whom I've had the honor of advising medically over the past 10 years. His only problem has been that of an arterial hypertension readily managed. About six weeks ago, he developed some symptomatology which was very interesting and which, Leslie, I'd like for you to tell us about it. Well, one morning as I awoke, I had a rather alarming symptom. I had a kind of a numbness around my left cheek and around my mouth. And uh, sort of a numbness in my left uh, hand and left foot. This didn't last very long, or did it? No, it didn't. It was only a matter of a couple of minutes. Most recurrent focal ischemic attacks, like those of Mr. Caburn, do not last over five or ten minutes. However, they may last from a few seconds to hours. Over a period of time, there may be a few or even hundreds. Because the neurological signs can be so very diverse, alternate possibilities may have to be studied initially, some of which are these. Further, of course, this patient's disorder is to be distinguished from that time. I had a kind of a blurred vision, which didn't last longer than a few seconds. And could you speak clearly? Well, my speech was rather holding, and uh, I had some difficulties in uh, remembering some words. Yes. All right, what about the frequency and uh, the intensity of these attacks? Well, sometimes they uh, didn't occur for two or three days, and then uh, two days following each other. I should see an average about three or four times a week. Yes. What do you think tends to bring these on, Leslie? Well, uh, sometimes, uh, for no reason at all, when I awake in the morning, still lying in bed, and sometimes uh, physical exertion, but the most frequent uh, occasions were uh, Emotional upset. Yes. Are you any better since you've been taking the anticoagulants? Well, uh... The all-important reason for differential diagnosis in these cases, of course, is that anticoagulant therapy frequently will thwart a major thrombotic attack. All right, let's go in and see how you are, will we please? Leslie, your heart's behaving very well today. Let's try the collateral circulation in your brain. Ever since Leslie's attack, he's had very little pulsation here in the common carotid artery. Is that antihistaminic working well? Oh, yes. Mouth is a little numb? It is. All right, put the tongue depressed. Did that give you any symptoms at all? None whatever. Though some physicians question the value of this technique, others who use it frequently find it useful with now, cooperative tongue patients. Tongue under your, in your teeth again. The internal carotid artery is pulsating quite big. In the field of cerebral vascular disease today, this patient, the one with transient focal ischemic attacks, is the person whom we are best able to help. Early diagnosis allows him every opportunity to return to work and lead a normal life. When a patient is comatose, the first question is often to decide whether the problem is vascular or otherwise. A history taken from a member of the family may be less than satisfactory, but will have to suffice. And how did you find him this morning when you left for work? This morning I went into his bedroom, I tapped him on the cheek and I said, Daddy, how are you? He says, I'm fine. I says, he asked me, if, how is the weather? I said, oh, it's beautiful. The sun is out. You'll be able. He says, oh, gl I'm glad. I'll be able to take a walk around the garden and uh, take a walk because that'll help my... So he was asleep and you wakened him by tapping. That's yes. right, doctor. I did. So he was no different this morning than every, any other morning. The physician morning. will want to find out what he can about the time of onset, abruptness of onset, and whether there had been any premonitory signs. 
All right. And how did you find him tonight when you returned? I found him uh, on the floor, his head underneath the bed, his legs between the bedroom and the foyer, and his uh, vomitus under his chest. And he mumbled to me, you could have found me dead. I see. Again, rather than going through the entire neurological examination, we will select only abnormal findings. There is marked nuchal rigidity and exhibition of pain even in the deep coma. There is flaccid quadriplegia. The plantar responses are extensor bilaterally. specifically hemorrhage. They are reinforced by the fact that there were no warning signs and that the onset, as far as we can tell, was fairly rapid. There are other items of information which indicate cerebral hemorrhage. The present blood pressure is 220 over 110. This compares with pressure of 180 over 105 at a previous examination. At the time of a cerebral hemorrhage, there is frequently a sudden rise such as this. Usually in hypertensive hemorrhage, if the patient survives, the pressure returns after a few days to its former level or below. Perhaps the most important indication of hemorrhage, of course, is the presence of blood in the cerebrospinal fluid. In a case of a ruptured aneurysm, blood is released directly into the subarachnoid space. The elevated pressure is typical. In such a case, no more fluid is removed than is absolutely necessary. This care is taken to obviate any chance of herniation of the brain through the tentorial opening or the foramen magnum, which some authorities hold to be a possibility. It is important, of course, to know that the presence of blood is not the result of a traumatic tap. The supernatant fluid, after centrifugation, shows the presence of blood pigment, indicating that intracerebral bleeding had occurred prior to puncture. We have, then, these various indications all pointing toward hemorrhage. The persistence of the coma itself is also more frequent in cases of hemorrhage than infarction. Intracerebral hemorrhage seems probable, but there is still the possibility of a ruptured aneurysm. We can often determine this by angiography. It is here in the circle of Willis and vessels arising from it that aneurysms most frequently occur. The vessels here are intact. There is in this area, however, evidence of pressure which could indicate an intracerebral clot. In the AP view, there is obvious evidence of pressure forcing the vessels from the midline. Compare the angiograms of another patient in which an aneurysm can be seen. The diagnosis would have been missed had the physician simply assumed that there was an intracerebral hemorrhage. 
When the diagnosis is intracerebral hemorrhage, there is often little that we can offer the patient beyond treatment of the hypertension, or in certain cases, surgery. Slim though our total armamentarium still is, antihypertensive drugs, vascular surgery, and anticoagulants, these are certainly only forerunners of others which a few short years will bring. Even with our present knowledge, we can offer the patient in whom we recognize premonitory signs every opportunity to continue an active and useful life. And we are certainly better able to help this man to regain self-sufficiency, better able to prevent a recurrence than we were 10 years ago. But before treatment and management stands the requirement accurate differential diagnosis.